So I think everyone can see my screen right now. Yes. Excellent, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, the methodology behind this uh, panel discussion is will be uh, three questions uh, that I will perform to our speakers. They will have time to answer them. And then I will allow to the, to the participants to enjoy and, and also to, to perform their questions and comments behind all this uh, opinion that they have around these uh, talks. So uh, if that is okay, I don't see, uh, Jackson, are you there? Ah, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, I don't see uh, Tessa also. Okay, excellent, thank you very much. So the first question that I would like to point out in this uh, panel discussion is, uh, in regards to gravity behave like general relativity, even at horizon size scales, and if there is a necessity for modifying gravity. So if that is okay, uh, we can start with uh, Tessa's opinion. Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, when Celia sent us this, this list of questions earlier today, I, I looked at them all and thought, oh Lord, <laughs> because they are all very big questions questions that of course um, you know we don't have an answer to right so so I don't have complete answers to any of these questions um, uh, so what is this what is this question asking uh, you know is the do we do we need modified gravity uh, and this ultimately boils down to to a matter of preference about how uh, far you're prepared to explore, I guess, in order to, to solve the cosmological constant problem, right? And I think there is a danger that uh, we, the cosmological, this cosmic acceleration has been with us for quite some time now that I think we become desensitized to it. Um, particularly people who are in some sense growing up entering the field uh, in, in the past uh, 20 years. And so I, you know, people do sometimes wave their hands and say, give up on modified gravity. It's clearly just a cosmological constant. But I think that's forgetting the magnitude of the problem we're trying to solve here. So um, I think there is still uh, a lot to explore in extensions of GR. And if we were to give up on that, then when we do have to bounce the problem back to high energy physics, back to string theorists or, or, or other ideas. And until another idea emerges from that direction, I think this is one of the best avenues to explore with what we know right now. So I can't say we need modified gravity, but I think there is strong arguments to keep investigating for the time being. Okay, um, excellent, Tessa. Um, Jackson, do you want to follow? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, so I, I guess the reasons are emerging as we're going forward in, into the future, whether it's the H naught tension or extra deuterium in the early universe or inflation. Yeah, I think things are happening as we're going along, right? Um, but it's a good idea to prepare because we would expect Lambda CDM given all the theoretical problems to break down as we get better and better observations. I guess maybe. Okay. Octavio? Yeah, uh, definitely I, I agree with the previous opinions. I guess from the basic scientific method, it should be tested if there is a change or not of general relativity of horizon scales. Definitely we still don't have a undisputable signal at the smaller scales, but uh, the community is working on that direction. And I guess this should be tested, definitely. Well, this is a question directed in the sense that uh, a couple of months ago, we heard that new results from DESI uh, apparently showed up that there is not any of this motivates some people, but I mean, uh, we need more uh, at that accuracy uh, level. Uh, yeah, more accuracy. 
dealing with these systematic problems. So that is why in that direction I wanted to take, no? if not get dismotivated for these uh, new surveys, but uh, also uh, to explore uh, the viability of theories that right now we have at hand. I think if I can add something, yes, one thing that I might add is, so this kind of, you know, it's like exhaustion that I referenced, you know, the kind of give up, give up it's clearly not working uh, or that, you know, because the data doesn't show anything. I think perhaps what that does point us to is that we are, um, to, to use an expression, barking up the wrong tree, uh, we would say here in the UK. So, so we're the kinds of, I think perhaps we have almost reached the end of the road for the kinds of theories that we are testing now in the sense that when cosmic acceleration was discovered, we did the very sensible thing, which is that we used all the field theory we knew from particle physics, and we started coupling in um, scalars and vectors and, and tensors. Now, there are other things like the kinds of things Jackson presented, but you know that is still a large part of the literature at the moment is coupling fields to, to GR. And I would like to think that perhaps uh, what the current data tells us is we need to do something completely different, like going from classical to quantum mechanics. There could be weed ideas that are a completely new way of looking at gravity, which may change it in ways that are so different from what we're doing now. Yeah, that is good. Any more comments, Jackson, Octavio? I think, I, I mean, that we need to be more creative, right? <laughs> to rethink from, from the ground up how, how, how to do this. Yeah, true. And also the participants can make some comments. And I, we are allowed to, to hear from them if you want to turn on the microphone and also uh, roll in the chat. Well, maybe I would like to add that if you are considering modified gravity theories at horizon scales, uh, when you consider a structure formation, so you have to consider more carefully things like the quasi-static limit for scalar fields that may be now not valid. So the dynamics or kinematics could be much more complicated than you are. And this can be down, but I mean, it depends on models. And this is things that will have to be done anyway <laughs> in the near, near future. Yeah, in that, in that, in that part, I mean, uh, it, it, should, it, it is still interesting to, to explore another kind of theories. For example, another is linked to, to the kinematics is uh, the cosmography. Cosmography is a scenario what is usually very helpful at high redshift, and also apart from uh, remaining this background of modified the theory as Jackson showed us uh, via the log law theorem, and also cosmography between uh, using to having a, at hand uh, that can help us to, to explore this uh, large richer range also it can be uh, a possibility and uh, viability uh, in this zoo of variety of, uh, of gravities. Uh, yes, Mariana, do you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky question. Uh, to think do we need to modify gravity? And uh, I was thinking about what the Professor Baker said, Baker said uh, that we are so built into the idea of a cosmological principle that maybe we are going beyond our relativity instead of looking at our relativity, but maybe thinking on different ways of uh, describing the the metric of, of the universe. And in the light of all these tensions that are growing and growing and growing, um, 
is a very interesting question to revisit how all of the cosmological uh, results are fixed to this particular assumption. Uh, why do we need to modify gravity? I think it's not just because, um, I mean, we can, right? <laughs> so that's, uh, that's a good uh, answer as a physicist. Uh, I think motivation is that, uh, of course, lambda as a cosmological constant is not giving a physical answer to the question behind the accelerated mechanism. And maybe the aim for looking for a physical first principle is valid into this quest of modifying gravity and then thinking about geometrical scenarios that can support all this evidence instead of just parametrizing with uh, fluid or parametrizing with uh, constant, right? But I would like to just point back to that issue that it might become more obvious as time goes by that we need to rethink more carefully how are we modeling the cosmological principle into all of our observables because it's more difficult it's more uh, challenging than just the uh, modified gravity, even if, I mean, I don't want to, <laughs> to underplay it in any sense, but yeah, I, I just wanted to put it uh, at the same level that, uh, yeah. Okay, excellent, Marina. thank you very much. Um, well, if you agree, we can go to the next question. And it should be, oh, Question that should be a question too, but <laughs> about the sharpened tension in the observed and inferred values of H naught, sigma eight, and S eight, is the tension a statistical fluke or it is pointed out to new physics? Lisa, do you <laughs> oh, want again. To... oh gosh, with, with the hardest questions ever. Uh, <laughs> um, so I should uh, I should have a massive disclaimer that I I am not the right person really to answer this question because I'm not someone who has done a lot of work with with um, you know sort of statistics of cosmological data. So um, what I can offer is obviously on the gravity side of things. So sorry to be like a, a one trick pony, but I don't I don't want to um, try and like criticize the Planck analysis. That's not, not my job. Um, but uh, certainly in terms of seeking explanations for new physics, the situation with changing gravity doesn't look great in the sense that people have asked, could this be used to kind of shape modify gravity theories? You know, could they explain the tension in H naught? And generally it seems that either you have to modify gravity at very early times, so around the era of recombination, which is really difficult in a lot of the theories I talked about because they generally are late time modifications. And, you know, it's quite hard to have something modify recombination era vanish nicely. So everything looks like Lambda CDM for most of the matter dominated era and then pop up again at late times. Um, or, other theories have been studied in this context and they can reduce the H naught tension, but not really resolve it. So it doesn't seem to be pointing towards modified gravity in a particularly strong way. So the new physics has to be something else potentially. Um, and then it's a question of how many extra pieces of new physics are you comfortable with on top of the Impluton dark matter uh, and, and dark energy. So my leaning at the moment is slightly away from new physics. I would say I'm more towards something mundane, but I would be delighted to be proved wrong because that would be far more exciting. Thank you, Tessa. Uh, Jackson? Yeah, I guess, I guess in, in a way it would be nice if it could, or easier if it could go away just by statistics magic in, in a way. Um, but I guess if it doesn't, if it remains with us, it will mean that we need to go beyond a, a, a lot of the, the toy models. I mean, into very complex models of modified gravity. So, you know, one problem in modified gravity is we have a lot of, in a, in a sense, toy models, but we don't, 
not, not very serious models in the sense that, that to really do the full analysis from early to late 10 years. And this will force us, in a sense, to, to be able to do that, I would say. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Octavio? Yeah, definitely with the current data, it doesn't look like a fluke. Uh, people have tried to investigate if any systematic it could be. Apparently, it looks robust. So, so it would be definitely great that is a uh, new physics, uh, either gravity or other components. Uh, I guess in the very likely in the next five, 10 years, because we'll have a lot of more data. All these studies of systematics probably are going to be more robust. And they may sound a bit boring, but once they are discarded, now we can go to, to the more interesting things that you mentioned formerly. Okay, thank you. Um, the, if the participants have another uh, comment, question that you want to apport to this uh, inquiry, I think this is a difficult question for all of us. <laughs> we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> okay, if not, uh, let me go to the last question of the day. I know that this is very, very broad in the sense that, okay, so, but I would really like uh, and probably all the participants would have to know about uh, which will be the future. I mean, and we are already living this in the near future for the cosmology. Hey, Petra, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, so I think there's one very obvious answer here, which is gravitational waves, right? Uh, in the sense that we have uh, 11 events in the public domain. And as I said, an, another 56 sort of in, in some partial state of release. So it's early days, it's still low number statistics, what we, we can do at the moment. But that even the, these tens of events have really got people thinking. And I'm sure no one here can have failed to notice, at least on, on if you're on the right archive um, subscriptions, the number of people now writing papers on, on gravitational waves. And I would include, you know, myself in that who, who previously weren't um it, i mean it's gone through the roof and there's a lot of new ideas coming about um so you know previously i think the focus of the gravitational wave community was really on on finding sources and modeling sources because obviously that's what you need to get the first detections and now that's here i think everyone else is coming up with ideas you know, we have things like the mass gap, new ideas to break the mass redshift degeneracy, new things to use these events for, for cosmology and tests of fundamental physics. So I think that's certainly going to continue for the near future. And probably what we'll find is of all these theoretical ideas that are being generated right now, some of them will, will really become the tools of the future. And some of them will turn out to be, you know, kind of nice idea in principle, but actually it, it, you know, it's hard to measure. And so some of them will fall by the wayside. But I think a few key new probes will emerge from that. On the EM side, um, obviously the, the near future is rest of DESI, uh, which we're getting results from already. And also in the next, you know, less than five years, we have Euclid and Vera Rubin set to release their first results. And I think a lot could depend on, on what they find. So if they come back with, um, was it, who is it who called it, the, was it Lisha Verde who called it the maximally boring universe? Right, you know. Yeah. That was the, the, that, yeah. <laughs> if they come back with that, then, oh, well, sadly, not much, not much changes. But if they come back with more statistical tensions or more statistical flukes, then, then it's really getting to a level where people are gonna kind of keep pushing, I think, on these, these tensions. Yeah, well, also, uh, apart from that, there is uh, this Einstein telescope that maybe offer another uh, point of view about uh, this uh, modified gra gravity. I hope that we can give you a hint in that direction as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's a, I, I personally would find that a slightly depressing future. By the time, so the Einstein telescope is due for construction around 20. 34, right? So if in 2035, first year of Einstein telescope data, we're still um, on the H naught tension, 
that's possible, no, but I hope we're not. <laughs> I hopefully that as well. But if not, our students will have more work in that regard. <laughs> Jackson, do you want to? Yeah. <laughs> I hope we will have moved on by then. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it depends. It, it usually depends on what the, as I said, it depends on what the surveys, what comes out of the surveys. I mean, the, who, who knows <laughs> what's going to happen on that side? I mean, there, there's not, I guess, from the theory side, there's been a, an exhaustive amount of work. And now it's about really like getting into more precision data. And I guess it depends on what comes out of the, these new surveys in the future. <laughs> Not so much in terms of predictions. Well, we can make a, a commercial with the extended theories, and then we can get more <laughs> side to this dark side. <laughs> and Octavio? Yeah, de definitely. I, I agree. Those things that were mentioned about gravitational waves, we are expecting about what the new generation of surveys will obtain. I hope it's going to be very interesting. I wonder actually, instead of an answer, I don't know if someone in the audience know about which are the future of experiments, for example. Uh, is there any hope for something for increase? Uh, uh, someone told me recently that from the, apparently something very independent like computational technology, like quantum computing, you need to have a very controlled system Technology is improving in that direction. Is that, can that have an effect on detection of fields or particles, vision of the current techniques? I don't have an idea, no, but I don't know if someone in the audience have any expertise. So. Yeah, well, I think uh, Jorge maybe can give you some uh, comments in that regards. Well, uh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I agree with, with the previous opinions. Um, I would add that uh, the cross correlation analysis of the different data sets will help a lot and it will increase. Also with CMB, new CMB props that will come in the near future will also help to to discriminate among models, and uh, that would be very exciting to see in the, in, in the next future. I was meaning uh, uh, also uh, cross correlation of different tracers in of a structure formation. Uh, with uh, Octavio mentioned that in his talk, uh, considering different tracers. Uh, different type of, types of galaxies and, and, and cross-correlate this information also with the CMB. And that uh, will, will, will bring a lot of information and maybe also the kinematic Sunjevs and Dovish, the thermal one uh, are very exciting topics now. And uh, well, we have a, a bunch of possibilities to work on. <laughs> Thank you, Jorge. So, uh, if the participants have another uh, comment or opinion or guesses, this was the my last question. Oh, yes. Uh, there is one. Uh, Beatriz, do you want to use the microphone, or do you want I can read your question? Oh, okay, I will read it. <laughs> uh, uh, Beatriz Miroslava asked, it is worth now because of precision cosmology compared to our understanding of the information we are getting? Have we exploded other resources? So other resources, now, I wonder what's, what's, what you mean by that Beatrice. So, one other resource that I could think of is things like laboratory tests of dark energy, um, which have been something that's kind of appeared over the past 10 years. So there's various tests of the chameleon screening mechanism that have been proposed can be done, well, are being done, in fact, in, in a couple of labs. Uh, and there's also tests of axions 
the fundamental scalar field, which which couples to electromagnetism, and so there's various um, various experiments that can be done there. So those are obviously much much cheaper than than launching satellites, and they are um, being exploited um, to great effect for those theories. I think the problem with those tests is that they're quite specific to a small number of, of models. Uh, and so they're not as powerful and not as generic as, as other cosmological, cosmological probes. Um, maybe there are more things like that to come. I, I, I couldn't say. Okay. Um, Jackson? Thank you, Tessa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure what other results. I mean, it, Hopefully, yeah, hopefully there'll be more resources, there'll be more innovative or novel tests, which maybe can be cheaper or maybe can be done in a different way, rather than doing the same thing, but more precisely. It, it depends, I guess. What, what Besides, I mean, tabletop experiments are, are one very good example. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, from the point of view, if it is worth, I guess uh, as long as questions and things that we don't understand are coming out, I guess it's, it's working. But definitely the strategy uh, doing uh, pushing those uh, laboratory tests that Tessa mentioned and maybe other ones that I don't know could be very interesting, have a broad uh, strategy. Uh, we may have a surprise. Yeah, I agree. Um, another participant that wants to make a comment or question before we uh, close this uh, panel discussion. Ah, yes, uh, Cesar, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Celia. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert in cosmology and much less in observations, but I, I always wonder, you always say about things about modifying gravity or uh, or the theories we have, but can, can can some of the participants mention what are, what are the assumptions in the observations data? Say you are assuming a homogeneous background where light is propagating, or or, or what are the assumptions you, you take into account to to interpret the data and get into into all these detectors? Kind of the, the most the more the most basic assumptions, basically, very roughly. Okay, Tessa, do you want to? Uh... Well, this is probably more a question for Octavio than than for me. But uh, I, I guess even most of them assume uh, uh, homogeneity and isotropy, right, uh, at the background level, uh, uh, of course. Um, so people have, uh, as I think was referred to earlier, looked at, you know, inhomogeneous cosmologies. Do we live at the center of a giant void? Um, does structure formation itself cause the acceleration of the universe? So those things have been explored in the past 10, 15 years, but the answer always seems to be that it's not a big enough ex effect to explain the observations uh, that we make. So most of the models we build now assume that. Um, some, most, but not all, assume um, Lorentz invariance. Um, a lot of the more, more recent modified gravity models even sometimes assume a lambda CDM-like background uh, and, and fit that and then really kind of put all their interesting physics in modified dynamics of perturbations um, rather than on expansion history. Uh, most assume uh, no coupling to electromagnetism, although again, there are a few few examples that do strange things there. I'm not sure what else to add to that list, so maybe another one of the panelists can can take it from there. Yeah, maybe waiting mm -hmm. for that to have more information about gravitational waves. I mean, we are, as you mentioned, we only have at hand one measure in that regard. And uh, well, also we are capable to do some forecasts, but uh, at the end, it, I think we are limited by this uh, capability not to, to have uh, more tools to go ahead. Uh, Jackson, do you want to go? 
It's early days, I guess, on that point. <laughs> um, well, I, I think the point about assuming lambda CDM in something, because now it was the case is that it is, it is a combination where lambda CDM plays a small or plays well, sometimes a big role, right? Um, but yeah, I don't know if there's any more assumptions to add. Sometimes there's, there's some simplifying theoretical assumptions, but then it's model dependent. Yeah, well, so my question is more like, uh, it, it seems that, that the natural question that has been asked in this panel is, uh, is it worth modifying gravity? Uh, but is it not equivalent saying, say, to, to, to consider or revisit the assumptions you make in the data acquisition and, and, and data interpretation, uh, if not simultaneously, instead of modifying gravity? So uh, when in my previous answer, I guess I, I was talking about really sort of basic fundamental assumptions. And I, my point was that breaking some of those really seems to break your predictions in a way that is inconsistent with current data. So we're fairly comfortable with those, that kind of level of fundamental assumptions, but perhaps there's a, a slightly more um, further down the pipeline level of assumptions that go in when, when surveys like, like DESI or UPID, et cetera, um, uh, produce their results, I, they do sometimes have to make um, perhaps one of the ones that springs to my mind a lot is measurements of the growth rate of structure, F sigma eight, are often assumed to be scale independent so that they can combine the data from all their different bins of scale in the survey. Um, uh, and and that's, that's an oversimplification that we would rather not do if we wanna test uh, more general ideas. But my understanding is that it's something that's done uh, as an observational requirement to get a good result, because otherwise you're, you know, you dilute your data to the extent that that it becomes unconstrained. Uh, and I think that's often a, a, a general reason for doing those things. If you try to do a really general analysis, you may end up with not really an answer at all. Um, so that kind of higher level of assumption could potentially be lifted. Um, if if we really are in have so much data that it's not a, a problem to do so. Octavio, do you have a comment? Yeah, I, this is important. People tried actually in EVOS to de see if they detect some scale dependence, but the data is not good enough. They they didn't have a signal. So yeah, we definitely need more information to test. I, I agree that this uh, all these tests. A, a cosmological principle or this high level assumption should be independently tested as much as possible. And I guess the answer for that is having more information. Oh, yes. Or, or flatness as well. As well, yeah, Planck is, is behind this as well. <laughs> uh, uh, Mariana, do you want to uh, share your microphone as well? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, I think it's a great question that uh, Cesar raised. Um, I don't have a lot of experience in any type of uh, data acquisition other than Galaxy Redshift service. So I can only imagine the process in, in that specific type of data analysis. And from my short experience, I would say Yes, it is a, a great question to be asked how many assumptions are we making into the process of converting the position of the tracers into cosmological constraints. But there are many steps that you have to be taken care of, uh, many of them that were explained by uh, Octavio, for instance, not only the Alka Pachinsky parameters that say, oh, this galaxy, I looked some red shift and then how do I know what distance it is for me okay this depends on the on the on the cosmology and then you can put lambda CDM or you can put anything you wish to describe uh, 
what distance is that you are converting the moving distance from the source to you. And you can do this for the millions of tracers in your sample. In the one hand, you need to do this for the position, but then you have all these perturbations uh, and all the steps that come into the explanation that Octavia gave about for the covariance matrices, you need to build a lot of mock, a lot of uh, simulations, and these simulations can be built with some or a different model. So it's, it's, it's a major task, and I I'm sure that it is already embedded into the efforts of all these uh, international collaborations. How strongly the conclusions depend on your assumptions. In my way of viewing, there's always six cosmological assumptions. Uh, but the, the, base, the, the most important ones would be assuming some dark matter particle in the way we, we, we talk about cosmologically not like physical uh, particle physicists, the cosmological constant or some other model that it has been uh, tested in the experiments like Ibos, uh, even Desi and Euclid in the future are thinking about uh, different ways of modeling this uh, term because it's the easiest way to model anyways. Uh, but my point is, uh, and, and of course I don't, think anybody has uh, thought about how to build the whole pipeline uh, removing a FLRW metric assumption because this is embedded in every every single cosmological uh, survey in every cosmological uh, assumption that we make so I don't think this is uh, thought because it's very difficult you will have to ask yourself what other theory of metric will I put, right? And there are different reasons to think about how to expand this answer. But I think that overall, I would say, yes, it's a very good question, but it's complicated because there are many steps that you have to be careful, like the halo occupation model. Okay, is this valid only for lambda CDM? How do we modify this? Uh, the perturbation theories, are these valid only, for, you know, vanilla cosmology or how do we modify for there are many steps but the next complication in the process is which model would you like to test how do you make sure that you're not going one by one by one by one can you make it more general and then you have to make a different set of assumptions and then you would like to combine data from different surveys but maybe they were built under different assumptions and then combining and cross correlating would be pretty challenging, I would say. I think it's a concern for all the community because all these efforts are being built and most of the data are being interpreted within the framework. And then we want to use it to test whether the cosmological model is this or that. So it's, it's, it's a very good question, I would say. In the sense that also it's kind of complicated to, to talk about that general a scenario most must be should be I think the, the word uh, it can be generic in a way we treated this in, in one of our works Mariana if you remember so it is part of, of, of the problem that we have at hand and I think it's interesting to, to pursue uh, at least to, to have a, a general panorama probably this is uh, also related with the second question in the sense that we want to to, to try to answer the, the the tension problems but making this assumption step by step in each in each part of the of the methodology it complicates the things and again we uh, ended in a in a road where we only have this generic point of view and not a general point of view so maybe in that part uh, is also interested to, to discuss and also try to another uh, I don't know another form, another uh, path to attack these 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 problems that inherent in the precision cosmology as well. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the rest of the uh, participants have another uh, opinion, questions. Okay, so if not, uh, thank you very much, uh, Thesa, Jackson, and Octavio for today, uh, for sharing whole day. I know that it's late for, <laughs> from your part, at least on the on the other side of the ocean. And we continue tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. And well, to, uh, tomorrow we start uh, the hour that says in this slide. And thank you again for all the participants and the speakers of, uh, to, of the talk that very, very well interesting talk. So I will see you tomorrow if that's fine. So thank you very much again. Okay, so <laughs> good afternoon and good night. Thanks very thank much. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.